So uh, we have been looking at problem of uh, solving ordinary differential equations subject to boundary conditions using method of orthogonal collocations. So this is uh, based on using uh, interpolating polynomial and this interpolating polynomial is used uh, over the domain of interest and this interpolating polynomial is then used to uh, discretize the problem, discretize the boundary with the problem. So let's make a quick recap of what we have achieved till now. I have been looking at this problem of uh, a general second order boundary value problem which is dz square psi is a general function du by dz u and z is equal to 0 now this this holds this equation is supposed to hold over domain 0 z less than 1 so here u is some dependent variable it could be temperature it could be concentration whatever whatever is temperature whatever is the variable of interest so we have this generic second order ordinary differential equation and then I have two boundary conditions at two boundaries so these are f1 so this is my boundary condition 1 and then my second boundary condition is du by dz so I have this generic problem of second order solving second order uh, ordinary differential equation subject to these two boundary conditions one at z equal to 0 the other one at z equal to 1 okay so if I draw this on this domain we have this domain here and we have already uh, set the convention of naming so we have this domain here this is this is z equal to 0 to z equal to 1 okay and then uh, we have a solution we have a polynomial solution interpolating polynomial solution which we have assumed so this is uz is equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 z plus alpha 2 z square plus alpha n z to the power n this is this is the interpolating polynomial which is the proposed approximate solution and we have this convention uh, of uh, you know uh, deciding or ca calling uh, uh, you know solution at certain points which are called as collocation points or the grid points so in this context we are going to call them as collocation points so we have these collocation points which are numbered you know z1 z2 z3 in general this is zi this is zi plus 1 this is zi minus 1 and the final one is uh, <coughs> the final point is called as z n plus 1 so we have this n plus 1 collocation points numbered from z1 z2 z3 up to up to z n plus 1 so these are collocation points okay now these collocation points need not be equispaced okay we have looked at finite difference method in finite difference method we looked at two options one was uh, the grid points as they were called in the um, finite difference method the grid points could be equispaced they could be non equispaced in this case uh, though in principle the, no one stops you from taking equispaced points we are going to look at uh, these collocation points chosen in a particular way these collocation points are going to be chosen at the root of uh, at the roots of shifted degenerate polynomials okay so these are going to be <coughs> uh, 
these collocation points are going to be chosen at the roots of the roots of shifted trajectory the polynomial are uh, given in the lecture notes. So uh, I just list them here. So for example, uh, Okay. If I take the first order polynomial, then so first order polynomial, then the root is at 0.5. Okay. If I take the second order polynomial, then the root is at 0.21132 and 0.788868. If I take third order polynomial, then I have three roots 0 0.1127, 0 0.5, and 0.8873, and so on. So if you if you look at the standard textbooks, you will get these roots of the uh, shifted Lagrangian polynomials, and I'm going to place these collocation points. I'm going to place these collocation points, okay, at the roots of this shifted Lagrangian polynomial. Which means, if I happen to choose three collocation points in this domain, okay, the first one, the first one, of course, z1 will be zero. The second one will be placed at 0.1127, okay. This is scaled. This this domain is scaled between zero to one. Typically, if it is length, you can you can divide by length and scale it to zero to one. So at point uh, 1127 will be my second point. My third point will be at 0.5. My fourth point will be at uh, you know point 8873. And my the last point, the fifth point, will be boundary z equal to 1. Okay. So likewise, in, in here, uh, in the accompanying notes, I have listed roots up to seventh order. Okay. And you will get if you want to know about higher order polynomials, you will get that in the literature. So this. But typically, uh, you know, it suffices to use uh, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth order polynomials. And if you want to have more uh, uh, collocation points, then typically what we do is we do orthogonal collocation on finite elements, which means we divide it into sub-elements, and on within that element we define collocation points. Okay. So we don't really go for if you want 50 collocation points, we don't do it by uh, taking the 50th order polynomial, we take a 5th order polynomial, divide this domain into 10 segments, and place roots inside each subdomain. Okay, but that we will not be discussing now. We'll be looking more at, uh, you know, a single polynomial being chosen. Right? Okay, so let's let's do a quick recap of what we have done till now. Uh, well, we we want to find the solution, approximate solution. And then uh, this approximate solution, I have a naming scheme. So my u1 corresponds to u, that is this approximate solution computed at z1. Okay, and u2 is u computed at z2 at the second collocation point. Okay, and so on. So in general, ui corresponds to u at z equal to Z i. Okay. <coughs> now, what we said in the last lecture is that you know we would like to we would like to express we would like to express these coefficients alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, alpha n. Okay. These are unknowns. Okay. This 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 is a proposed approximate solution for this uh, ordinary differential equation. Okay, and this coefficients, this coefficients, I want to express in terms of u1, u2, u3, u4, and so on. Okay, so what is known to me here? What is known to me here is I have chosen the collocation point. So the collocation points are known to me. Okay, so these locations, that is z0 uh, or z1 equal to 0 to uh, you know z2. Let's say if you take three points. Z, z2 equal to 0.1127, these, these locations are known to me. Okay. Now, 
what we have done in the last lecture is like this. Okay, to get to get unknowns transformed from alpha zero to alpha n. Okay, we wrote this equation at n plus one collocation points. So I wrote this equation u one, u two, up to u n plus one. So u n plus one is at the last point. Okay, then uh, this will be one z one. Z1 square up up to Z1 raised to n 1 Z2 Z2 square up to Z2 raised to n and so on. Okay, and we have this one Z n plus one Alpha zero, alpha one, up to alpha n. Okay, I wrote it in this form. This is my. I defined this matrix as A matrix. If you recall, I call this as vector theta, and these are my unknowns. These were represented as capital U. Okay, so to eliminate, to express this alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four in terms of Unknowns u1, u2, u3, u4. Well, the the problem here is that u1, u2, u3, u4 are actually solutions of this this ordinary differential equation. Okay, at the collocation points. So this u1, u2, u3, u4 are not known to us. They will be known to us when we solve the differential equation. Okay. So here there is a trouble. Trouble. We do not know u1 to u n plus one. We do not know alpha zero to alpha n, but we want to transform the problems from these as unknowns to these as unknowns. Okay, so the way it has been done is to write this equation u is equal to a theta. Okay, this implies that theta is equal to a inverse u. Okay, theta is equal to a inverse u. Next, what we have done is we need we need derivatives of this function to be evaluated. See, because here in this equation you have d two u by d z square, you have d u by d z. So I need these two equations to be evaluated, right? So for this, what I have done is so in the last class I derived this expression just to recall. I will not. Uh, Derive it again. I just uh, write the expression. Okay. So we we said that we wrote this. We wrote this as one z z uh, to the power n into theta. We wrote this as inner product of two vectors. One vector is one to one to z n. Okay, and times theta. What is theta vector? This is theta vector. Okay, <coughs> this is theta vector. And then, then uh, we said that this is nothing but one z z to the power n into a inverse u. Theta was replaced by a inverse u. Okay, so in the, instead of unknown as theta, we have now unknown as u. Okay. And then I wanted du by dz. Okay, I wanted du by dz. If you take du by dz, this vector becomes z becomes zero one up to n z to the power n minus one a inverse u. Right? Yes. This vector is just zero to yeah. And then uh, I want to evaluate the derivative. I want to evaluate the derivative at these collocation points. So, if I want to evaluate the derivative at the collocation points, this becomes so du by dz at 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 z equal to zi. Okay, this is equal to this is equal to zero one n 
zi raised to n minus 1 a inverse u. Okay, so this is the expression that we derived for the first derivative. Okay, similarly, we derived the expression for the second derivative. Okay, we derived the expression for the second derivative. What is this expression? So, so I called this. Okay, before I move to the second derivative, uh, this this vector. Okay. I call this vector as SI. I call this vector as SI transpose. Okay, this SI transpose, okay, was defined as zero, This matrix, this A matrix is known to us. Okay, this A matrix is known to us. So A inverse is known to us. A A matrix can be computed using, you know, since we know uh, z1, z2, z3, we can compute A matrix. We can compute A inverse. Okay, so this this matrix is known. Since we know z i, we also know this row. Okay, so this row times this matrix. This will be a row vector. That row vector, I am calling it as, okay, SI SI transpose. So my D, okay, my equation assumes the form du by dz equal to si transpose u okay so likewise i also derived i also derived expression for the second derivative d2u by dzi okay dz square okay and that turned out to be i just give the final expression because we have done it last time so it turned out to be 0 0 2 Okay, we derived a generic expression for the second derivative. Okay, just 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 look here. This is this is the first derivative. If I differentiate this with respect to z again, you will get zero zero n minus one will come here. Okay, this is just differentiation of this. This is a constant matrix. So, so this this expression naturally follows from this, and this is what this is what we got. We decided to call this particular vector as ti i decided to call this particular vector as ti transpose into u okay so which means i have an expression that is d2u at zi dz square is equal to ti transpose into u okay i have expression so so what I have achieved, what I have done is I have expressed the derivative at a particular point at z equal to zi, okay, as a vector times unknowns. What are the unknowns? Unknowns are unknowns are values the dependent variable takes at the collocation points, u1, u2, u3, u4. Okay, so this is the derivative at this point is some linear combination is some linear combination of this vector u12 okay see what is the difference here <coughs> so when are u1 to u2 and u3 defined so this is u1 this is u2 this is u3 and so on so this is ui ui plus 1 so this will be u uh, so this is zn so this is un this will be un minus 1 and so on okay so what is my u vector my u vector consists of this dependent variable values at 
point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so this is this is entire vector is that u vector. Okay, see what has happened. When you do finite difference, when you do finite difference, okay, you express the local derivative using only neighboring points, or you express the second derivative only using neighboring points. Whereas here, whereas here, the first derivative or the second derivative is a linear combination of entire okay u1 to un so this is the difference this is the main difference okay everything comes into every comes into the picture okay so this this is much much better way of finding the derivative than taking a local derivative okay and then this now we are going to use to formulate the problem okay so last time we stopped here let's now actually Form the, uh, you know, the substitute these values at the grid points and come up with the uh, equations that need to be solved to uh, get this u1 to uh, un plus one. We still do not know what are the values of u1 to un, un plus one. All that we have achieved till now is to express these derivatives in terms of the unknown unknown variables. What are the unknown variables? u1, u2, u3 up to un plus one. Which are values the, the dependent variable takes at the collocation points. Okay? okay. Now let's see how to solve the problem. Now I want to solve this problem. Okay. So actually, see this ordinary differential de equation. Where is it defined? It's defined on the domain. Yeah. It's defined on the domain zero to one. So it should hold. Where where should it hold? Everywhere. Ideally, the true solution, okay, should set the true solution u z. Okay, this is not the true solution. This is an approximate solution. The true solution should actually hold at every point in this domain. That's what it says. Okay. Now, when we solve it by orthogonal collocation, we are going to say that well, the approximate solution should hold only at the collocation points. Okay. Right now, we are not saying anything. What happens? In between, at the collocation point, this equation should be satisfied. At the collocation point, this equation should be satisfied. Okay, so this is discretization. Actually, actually, we are looking at only finite number of points where the equation should hold. The original equation should hold everywhere. Okay, so what's going to happen now is because of this approximation, this ordinary differential equation will get transformed into set of nonlinear or linear algebraic equations okay then so this should hold inside the domain at the boundary points what should happen this equation should hold at first boundary this equation should hold at the second boundary so this this these equations okay enforcing this equal to 0 at each of the collocation points will give you a set of equations plus these two will give you two more equations will have number of equations equal to number of unknowns and then we are going to solve it okay so now let's let's embark upon solving the problem okay so the game plan is is enforce So this is called residual. I'll, I'll just write down what you will understand what why I'm calling it residual to zero at each collocation point. So that means what I'm going to do, I'm going to solve this equation. This is called residual, residual psi. Okay. Now d2 u zi by dz square du zi by dz u zi okay or in, in, in our case u zi is nothing but u i zi should be equal to 0 this this term I am going to call as residual I want this equation to hold at every grid point which are those grid points for 
i equal to 2, 3, up to n. Okay? I want this to hold at okay. Now if I substitute, if I substitute for expressions that I have got, see the the derivatives are now expressed in terms of algebraic expressions. Okay, I'm going to replace them. So this actually means I want to solve for T i transpose u s i transpose u u i z i equal to zero. Look at this equation here. Okay, see. Uh, du by dz square I have replaced by equivalent algebraic approximation okay uh, sorry d2u by dz square I have replaced by appro appropriate algebraic approximation du by dz I have replaced by appropriate algebraic approximation okay so this differential equation is now converted into an algebraic equation how many such equations we have got now we got to i equal to 2, 3, 4, up to n. So how many equations? n minus 1. We got n minus 1 starting from 2 to n. We got n minus 1 equations. Okay. We are going to set this residual equal to 0 at each of the collocation points. Internal collocation points. Okay. Now what about boundary conditions? See how many unknowns are there? u1, u2, u3 up to un plus 1. Okay. So how many equations you need? You need n plus 1 equations to solve, get, okay. How many equations we got till now? n minus 1. So we need two more equations. Those two equations are going to come from boundary conditions. Okay. So the boundary conditions will give me additional two equations that completes the set. You get n plus 1 equations in n plus 1 unknowns, and then we are solving the problem. We, we will solve them using, uh, okay. So let's write the two additional equations. Okay, so the next equation is F1. Okay, uh, S1 transpose U, U1 at Z equal to 0 equal to 0. This is my first equation. This is my first equation. And F2 S n plus 1 transpose U. u n plus 1 and 1 equal to 0 ok see now now you have these two equations these two equations ok and this these n minus 1 equations ok these n minus 1 equations together with these two equations forms the set of n plus 1 equations. n plus 1 equations in n plus 1 unknowns, we need to solve them simultaneously. Okay. If these happen to be linear, linear algebraic equations, we can solve them analytically. If they happen to be non-linear algebraic equations, you have to solve them iteratively using some iterative method. Okay. So what we have done here, we have achieved transformation of the problem, of a boundary value problem, okay, from a differential equation to a set of algebraic equations. Okay, using approximation theory, what, what method in approximation theory we have used? We have used interpolation, interpolating polynomial. Okay, so this, these equations, then, then you know, you can solve it using the standard tools like uh, Newton's method, newton raphson or successive substitutions, whatever, whatever is suitable that you can use to solve this particular problem afterwards. Okay, let's take a specific example, then it will be uh, easier for you to understand. Before that, I just, for the sake of convenience, I want to define two matrices, okay? Uh, using this S vectors and using this T vectors, using this T vectors, uh, I'm going to define two matrices, S and T, okay? Uh, I'm going to give you a method to compute them very easily, okay? So, uh, we will define these two matrices and then uh, for a given number of collocation points, one has to first construct these matrices 
and then use them to formulate your equation. One thing which, which uh, I would like to bring to your notice here is that in every equation, these are dense equations. These are dense equations. In every equation, okay, u1 to u n plus 1 will appear. Okay, because the derivatives are approximating not locally but using all the points in the domain. Okay, since the derivatives are uh, you know approximated using all the points, these equations will be dense. Okay. So this is this is this is something different from if you do finite difference, okay, only two neighboring variables will appear in one particular equation. Here it is not like that. Every variable will appear in every equation. Particularly if you take a single polynomial over the entire domain. Okay. So that is a that is a big difference. Okay. So let me define this matrix S and T and then uh, we will take this particular example that we have been using quite often or we will be using quite often in the course which is a tubular reactor with axial mixing so so before we do that let me define these matrices uh, so this s matrix is going to be defined like this it's 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 consists of s1 transpose S2 transpose. So here S superscript 1 implies it's a it's a vector. First vector, second vector, third vector, and so on. So this is this this is going to be S n plus 1 transpose. Okay? So this this is a n plus 1 cross n plus 1 vector. Okay? This is a n plus 1 cross n plus 1 vector. Okay, and it's very easy to show that uh, this can be this can be computed by this can be computed by looking at this another matrix zero one. So if I if I decide to call this if I decide to call this matrix as say C matrix, then this is equal to C times A inverse. C times A inverse. Well, how was our A matrix defined? A matrix was defined. This this keep it in background that we had this equation that u is equal to A theta. Okay, u equal to A theta. So A matrix is defined okay, using 1, z1, z2 and so on. So likewise, likewise, I am also going to define uh, this T matrix. I am going to define this T matrix. This T matrix will consist of So I have stacked up, I have stacked up these row vectors, I have stacked up these row vectors, okay, to create this matrix, okay. Why, why this funny notation? Because in our course, whenever we are defining a vector, it's a column vector. When I want to make it row vector, I am taking a column vector and putting it as a transpose. That's why this notation, which is which we are getting, okay. And then you can show that uh, this matrix is equal to this can be very easily computed using d times a inverse and what is this d matrix okay this is n plus 1 cross n plus 1 this is also n plus 1 yes this is also n plus 1 cross this is also n plus 1 cross n plus 1 matrix yeah so let's write this d matrix this d matrix is 
slight modification of this matrix. So D matrix will look like this. D matrix will be 0, yeah, 0, 0. This will be 0, 0, 2, 6, Z1. n minus 2, this is n minus 2 and so on. So this is nothing but okay, then this D matrix will look of these stack vectors. Okay, these are nothing but T i vectors evaluated at different collocation points and this together with A inverse post multiplied by A inverse is going to give me T matrix. Okay. So I need to create the, as a preparation for solving this problem. Okay. I need to create this S and T matrices okay, by choosing collocation points. Once I choose collocation points, okay, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever, once I choose the collocation points, I can first find out A matrix. Once I find out A matrix, I can find out A inverse and then I can define C and D matrices and from that I can get S and T matrices. Once I get S and T matrices, I want to use rows of these matrices to discretize my uh, ordinary differential equation and convert it, into <coughs> convert it into algebraic equations. Let's take a specific problem that you will understand it better. Okay? So this is our tubular reactor this is tubular reactor with axial mixing okay this is the problem which we have been uh, which we have looked at earlier when we studied the uh, finite difference method okay uh, the associated uh, ordinary differential equation is 1 by Peclet number into d2c by dz square minus dc by dz minus da c square is equal to 0. So this, this is the ordinary differential equation that should hold between 0, z, 1 then you have two uh, conditions okay you have two conditions that is uh, dc by dz okay is equal to pe into c0 minus 1 and this should happen at at z equal to 0 and dc by dz equal to 0 at dc by dz at z equal to 0 equal to 0 okay this is the this is the second condition that we have two boundary conditions and second boundary condition should hold over to 1 at, okay, yeah. second boundary condition should hold at z equal to z equal to 1. The second boundary condition should hold at z equal to 1. So this is my problem. This I want to discretize. 
Okay. Let's say let's say I have chosen three internal points. Okay. So I'm going to do a very simplistic solution. So this is my z1. This is my z5. Okay. I have three collocation points. Okay. This is z2, z3, z4. Okay. I have taken collocation points at the roots of the third order degenerate shifted degenerate polynomial. Okay. So this this happened to be. So this happened to be. You know. So the first one is at point one one two seven. Second one is at point five. Third one is at point eight eight seven three. Okay. This z five is equal to one and z one is equal to zero. So we have five collocation points, three internal collocation points, two boundary points. Okay, and then we are going to get five equations in five unknowns. Okay, we are going to get five equations in five unknowns. Now, <coughs> if I okay, what is the first thing to do here? First thing to do is to compute a matrix. Okay, first thing to do is to compute a matrix. So a matrix. Okay, if I actually compute a matrix. Okay, if I compute uh, using these five points, it will be five cross five matrix. Okay, then if I compute S and T matrices, okay, uh, I'll just write here a sample of S and T matrix. So S matrix first first row turns out to be minus thirteen, fourteen point seventy nine, minus two point six seven. One point eight eight minus one, and so on. Okay, so this is a five cross five matrix. So there are five rows. This is the last row. This is the first row. Okay. Likewise, knowing these points, once I have chosen these points, I can compute a matrix. Okay, then I can compute C and D matrices. Then I can compute S is equal to C into A inverse. I can compute T is equal to D into A inverse because A, C, and D these matrices depend only on the values of the collocation points. Okay, so once I have got these got these matrices, okay, then I am going to use these rows of these two matrices to convert this. Differential equation into set of algebraic equations. Okay, so what is what is my first equation? So I have I have three equations at the three internal collocation points coming from this differential equation. I have two equations coming from boundary equations. Okay, so my equations would look something like this. So one by P E into T I transpose times C vector minus S I transpose times C vector minus D A C I square is equal to zero. Okay. I going from two three four. Okay. What is the c vector? C vector now consists of c one, c two, c three, c four, and c five. Okay. C vector consists of c one, c two, c three, c four, c five. Okay. So this. This, so this row, this row times c1, c2, c3, c4, c5, okay, plus this row times c1, c2, c3, c4, c5, plus c2 square when i equal to 2. Okay, second row. Here you will choose the second row from the matrices. 
here when you choose i equal to 3 you will choose the third row from s and t matrices okay and you will get here da into c3 square okay so you are getting three nonlinear equations you are getting three nonlinear equations and the two additional equations arise from boundary conditions okay so the two additional conditions that you get is s1 transpose c minus pe into c1 minus 1 is equal to 0 and s5 transpose c minus is equal to 0 okay so these three equations these three equations plus these two equations together they form five nonlinear algebraic equations which need to be solved simultaneously okay because particularly these equations everything appears all the equations c1 to c5 will appear in all the equations okay these are coupled nonlinear equations they have to be solved iteratively using newton's method newton raphson or some some nonlinear equation solver which <coughs> may be optimization method, whatever is at, at hand for you to uh, solve this. So this is this is uh, the original problem, okay, which is actually defined on a domain which is not finite dimensional. See the true solution here. Let's come come back here. What is the true solution here? True solution here is the concentration profile as a function of z, okay, z varying from zero to one. So it's a function, okay? It belongs to which set does it belong to? It belongs to the set of continuous functions, twice differentiable, defined on domain zero to one. The true solution is actually that we have discretized the problem, okay, using interpolation polynomial, only converted into a fifth order, you know, fifth not fifth order, sorry, five-dimensional vector. Okay, so we are approximating an infinite dimensional solution using a five fifth order, uh, sorry, five dimensional vector. Well, you can increase, you can increase the number of collocation points to so seven, eight, nine, but you know how many you can go. So, if you want to really make uh, a higher dimensional approximation, what one could do is one could divide this into segments, and on each segment, one can define a lower order collocation polynomial. Okay, then of course that is called as uh, orthogonal collocation on finite elements. Then you have to write conditions uh, by which the neighboring solutions are you know uh, meet each other. So those those conditions will have to be written. Okay, additional conditions will come so out of that continuity. to maintain the continuity of the solution. You will need additional conditions to be imposed. Okay, but this is the basic principle. Once you understand this, you know extending it to finite element is not difficult. This concept is this. Okay. Now, before we close this lecture, I also want to show that this is not just converting partial the, the boundary value problem. I am going to just take a, a version of the same problem, which is a partial differential equation. Okay, and then you will see that the partial differential equation, okay, will get converted into an ordinary differential equation, set of ordinary differential equations. Here, here, this is a there is no time involved here. Okay, I am going to now convert this into a partial differential equation by including the time derivative. If I include the time derivative, the same, uh, you know, same problem. Okay, instead of getting transformed into set of coupled algebraic equations, nonlinear algebraic equations, it will get transformed into set of coupled uh, ordinary differential equations. Okay, then, then of course you have to use methods to solve the ordinary differential equations. That is a separate thing. Okay, right now we are just looking at the problem transformations. Okay, so let's do a quick, quick recap. What we have done is uh, we have this, uh, we have this uh, second order ordinary differential equation. Okay, we wanted to, we have proposed a polynomial interpolation uh, based solution, approximate solution for this uh, dependent variable in terms of independent variable z. Okay nth order polynomial uh, interpolation polynomial and then we are forcing this residual we call this as a residual to be zero at a finite number of collocation points these collocation points are chosen at at roots of the shifted degenerate polynomial 
Okay, why why shifted Lejeune is polynomial? Why not why not at some uh, you know say regular intervals and so on? It has been found that if you actually place them at the shifted Lejeune polynomial, then the approximation errors are low. Okay, so so the the reason for choosing ortho normal or orthogonal polynomial, the roots of the orthogonal polynomial, is to get uh, less approximation errors. Okay, so. So there's a reason why we choose the, the collocation points in a special way and not equispaced and so on. So uh, let's not get into that part, but just accept this now that you know if you put them at uh, special locations, then the approximation errors are low. Okay. So then we looked at one problem, which is tubular reactor with axial mixing, and this problem, what has happened is we we are able to convert this particular problem into set of five coupled uh, non-linear algebraic equations which need to be solved iteratively further okay which will give you an approximate solution okay now here because the derivative approximation is much better okay a derivative approximation is much better typically it is found that a good solution can be obtained using less number of collocation points. So till now we have looked at finite difference method. Okay. In a finite difference method, you need large number of collocation points. Oh, sorry, you need large number of grid points to get a good solution. Because you know you are taking local approximation of the derivative. Okay? We are taking local approximation of the derivative. So you need large number of grid points to get a good solution. So what is the meaning of large number of grid points? Large number of grid points means See, suppose you were to enforce this equation at this residual to be equal to zero at large number of grid points, the number of equations that you need to solve simultaneously will be large. Suppose you know to get a good solution using finite difference, I need to subdivide this into hundred small intervals. So then here, you know, when you transform this into algebraic equations, you get hundred algebraic equations plus two algebraic equations at the boundary. So hundred two algebraic equations. Okay, what is found here is that with this approximation, a uh, less number of collocation points, a smaller order polynomial gives you a good solution in many cases. Okay, so here, using this method, you can get good approximations using uh, you know less number of less computations in, in some sense. Okay, so uh, just to compare. Before, before we just uh, uh, close the uh, lecture, let's just look at the partial differential equation and then let's see what happens. Now I'm going to keep the same problem. Okay? I'm not going to change the problem except in this case, in this case, I looked at the steady state solution. I did not involve, I did not consider a time. But suppose you were to consider the transient response of the tubular reactor with axial mixing. Let's keep the same problem, okay? Uh, so I'm going to say here, dou c by dou t is equal to. So these become partial derivatives, dou two c by dou z square, dou c by dou z into. So the time derivative is earlier we had put it equal to zero. Now the time derivative is not equal to zero. So now my second example. That is, this is PDE. Okay, so I want these conditions. I want these conditions to hold at all time. So I want this condition to hold at all the times. So d c t by d z, okay, is equal to
Okay. Now the time has come into picture. Now time has come into picture. Okay. And uh, I want the solution to obey these. I want the solution to obey these equations at all the times. Okay. At all the times. So this is C T. So now there are two attributes to the solution: time and space. There are two attributes to the solution. This is a partial differential equation. Earlier we were looking at a boundary value problem. There was only one attribute, that is one independent variable, that was space. Now my solution will be time and space. Okay. So when I convert this problem, when I discretize this problem, I am going to only consider discretization in space. I am not going to write down discretize in time. I am going to keep time intact. Okay. And discretize only the the right hand side, the spatial part. Okay. So what happens if I so, so at the internal collocation points, at the internal collocation points, I get three differential equations. What are those three differential equations? Now there are three differential equations in time. Okay, the right hand side becomes algebraic. Okay, because these derivatives are approximated using method of collocations. Okay, this we don't approximate. Okay, right now. So we have this equation which is written at the three internal grid points. Okay, d. C i by d t, okay, is equal to one by Taylor number into t i transpose c. So here now of course c t minus s i transpose c t minus d a c i t square. Okay, I going from two, three, and four. Okay, I going from two, three, four. Okay, and then this last two equations actually last two equations becomes two algebraic constraints. So what you get, what you get is set of differential algebraic system. Okay. What you get now, because these 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 are spatial derivatives. These are this is a time derivative. Okay, the spatial derivatives will get converted into algebraic equations. Okay, so there are algebraic constraints to be obeyed at the boundary points. Okay, and this partial differential equation gets converted into ordinary differential equation. Okay, so we have three ordinary differential equations. And there are two algebraic constraints at the boundary. That is S1 transpose C T equal to differential equations these are three coupled nonlinear differential equations and they are coupled tightly with these two algebraic constraints and they have to be solved simultaneously you can see here what is the ct vector ct vector is c1t c2t c3t c4t and C five D. Okay, so D C two by D T, D C three by D T, D C four by D T, all of them are functions of C one, C two, C three, C four, C five. Not only that, because of this square coming here, these are nonlinear functions. Okay, so there are three nonlinear differential equations, two algebraic equations coupled. Okay, in this case, you may be able to eliminate two variables. Let's say you decide to eliminate the the first and the last. Okay, you decide to eliminate u. You decide to eliminate c1 and c5. It may be possible because these two are linear constraints. These two are linear constraints. Okay, there is no nonlinearity here. So you might be able to rearrange and express. Okay. Uh, C2, you might be able to express C1 and C5 in terms of C2, C3, C4. 
If you do that, then you can eliminate here, and then you will get three differential equations in three unknowns, and then you can solve them by whatever method. But then, but then, uh, you know, uh, uh, that is one way, or you you solve them simultaneously using a method for uh, solving differential algebraic systems. Okay, so this is how you transform a problem which is which is originally a ordinary differential equation boundary value problem okay into set of algebraic equations linear or nonlinear okay if it happens to be a partial differential equation you will get a set of ordinary differential equations plus algebraic conditions these have to be solved simultaneously and then you arrive at the solution okay so what we have learned in this in this part is that you know how interpolation polynomials can be used to transform a problem okay so <coughs> we began by uh, see what is the foundation of all this the foundation is that you know uh, why why we could construct a polynomial solution because some time back i talked about weierstrass theorem what does weierstrass theorem tell you weierstrass theorem tells you that any any continuous function can be approximated arbitrarily by using uh, a suitable order polynomial okay that's why we could we could construct a polynomial approximation to the solution cz or ctz okay that's why we could construct a polynomial approximation okay now using that polynomial approximation how do you construct a polynomial approximation weierstrass theorem only tells you that there exists a polynomial approximation here you know you actually can uh, you have to actually construct it the first method that we saw was taylor series approximation okay that led to finite difference method the second method that we saw was interpolation that has given rise to orthogonal collocations okay in the next class onwards we will start looking at v squares method so v square fitting okay and then in the in the context of this square fitting is a very very vast area and i'll be talking not just about converting boundary value problems or partial differential equations i'll be talking about many more things under these squares now uh, there you know uh, in the context of partial differential equations or boundary value problems we'll get the method of finite element the so called method of finite element okay so with this we'll close this lecture and move on to these squares methods in the next class <coughs>